Welcome, friends, to Voice of Assurance, the MP3 edition. I'm Dr. Tom Kakuza, pastor of Northland Bible Baptist Church in St. Cloud, Minnesota. The purpose of Voice of Assurance is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and to equip believers through verse-by-verse -verse preaching and topical message. Now, while there is no substitute for individual participation in a sound local church, I trust these messages will augment your spiritual growth and be a blessing to you. Let's go ahead now to the message. Today we're going to be talking about godly biblical instruction, and again, I've entitled this Teaching Our Children the Word of Life. You might want to write this down. There is no learning without control. There is no learning without control. One of the biggest problems in our public schools today is that the schools are out of control, the children are out of control, therefore it hinders effective learning. Now that doesn't mean some kids won't learn. Some kids are just bright kids and they're going to learn and they're, they're going to, it's easily easy for them to grasp that. But without self-control, many times learning is something that is really hurt. This is why discipline is so important. It brings a child into submission and respect of the parents. And when they respect you and they are in submission, there's a much greater chance that they're going to listen to what you have to tell them. And that listening to what you have to tell them has to do with uh, what is it we're going to tell them? Well, that's what we're talking about this morning, teaching them the word of life. Once they are in submission, then the parents have the responsibility to teach their children the word of God and the ways of God. Now, listen, don't, don't fall for the stuff that's going on today. It says, well, you know, I don't want to push this on them. I want them to discover their own way and all this. There are many people in groups and, and organizations who are wanting your child to adopt their way. Now, we have a responsibility before God as Christian parents to teach our children God's way, okay? Now, whether they receive it or embrace it for their own, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute, that's a whole nother issue. But we still have the responsibility. Don't think, well, well, you know, I don't want to be accused by anybody of kind of brainwash my kids with Christianity and all this. Number one, that's an insult to God to even say such a thing. You, are, you have the responsibility to teach them the only thing that can deliver their life from destruction. Now you might say, well, what about the church? Isn't that the church's responsibility? The church's responsibility certainly is to make disciples for Christ. But part of that is to equip the parents with what they are to teach their children. And if all your kids get is what they get at church and they're not getting it at home, uh, there's, a, there's a failure there. There's a major breakdown in the plan of God, as we are going to see here in the Bible. This is all part of discipleship and our goal in parenting. And what is the goal in parenting? Remember, for our children to grow up to be not only saved, but godly, dedicated believers who love and serve Christ. Now, this issue of instruction, godly biblical instruction, is part of that. Teaching them the word of life is part of that. And if you are not teaching your children the word of God, you are dropping the ball in at least one area of your family. They need to be learning it. Now, I'm going to describe how to do that a little bit today, more about the how-to next week, but we're laying a foundation today. Look with me over to Genesis chapter 18. The Lord talking about Abraham, and it says this in verse 19, it says, For I know him, I know Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him, which was, of course, blessing. Of course, now, now, what about this teaching? Where does it begin? Well, it begins with salvation. Obviously, it begins with salvation. Can I say this this morning, parents? Listen, don't think your kids are just going to end up saved. Well, they'll catch it. It'll just osmosis into them. Okay? Certainly we are concerned about their souls, and, if, and, and certainly if they come to Northland Christian School, we're concerned about their salvation. And if you come to this church, we're concerned about their salvation. But the primary responsibility of your child knowing the gospel and getting saved is your responsibility, your responsibility to be sure that they get it and that they trust Christ as Savior. Now, you can't make them. That's an act of the will. We know that. You can't make them believe 
But children usually will believe pretty much anything you tell them. That's why you have to be careful what you say. Folks, this begins with the gospel, okay? Now, now it doesn't mean the only thing, the, the first thing you talk to your children about is, is the gospel. Don't bind yourself into that. It's, it's the whole mindset, the biblical mindset. But the gospel is certainly part of that. But here's one thing you don't say. Now, I, I know this may step on some toes, and I don't mean to, but it needs to be said, okay? If you're talking to your child about salvation, don't say to your child, are you, are you ready to ask Jesus in? into your heart? That's nowhere found in the Bible. Not one place is that found in the Bible. Nowhere. Are you ready to give your life to Jesus? That's not salvation. Okay, that's dedication. You don't, that's, don't confuse it. Your children will believe what you tell them. Okay, uh, I know there's, you know there's a whole line of thinking about the ask Jesus in your heart thing. Well, you know, your, your heart inside you, your heart is a little door. The handle of the door is on the inside, not on the outside, because Jesus is not going to force his way in, okay? He'll knock, but he won't force his way in. Is that really in you? That is not in your body. There is no such thing as the door of a heart, okay? There's no such thing as that. Don't tell your kids that. Tell them the truth. Do you believe the gospel is the power of God into salvation? I do. Then tell them the truth. Tell them what the Bible says. Well, they can't understand it. They can't understand that, but you're telling me they can understand that they got this little door inside their chest and it's only got a handle on the inside? And No. Listen, you'll never go wrong if you say what God says. That's profound. And I'm not the originator of that. That is a profound truth. You'll never go wrong if you say what God says, because when you say what God says, you're honoring his word, and God will bless your efforts. Okay? Don't ever tell your children such a thing, because it's just not biblical. It's, well, it means the same. It does not mean the same at all. To put your faith in Jesus Christ as your payment for sin is not the same as invite him into your heart or give him your heart or ask him to come in or open the door. There's no door. It has is nothing to do with that. Well, what about Revelation 3.20? We don't have time to cover that today. We've covered it before. I'll be glad to cover it with you personally. Revelation 3.20, those written to Christians, not lost people. And I know that's the one that's used. Anyways, but where does it begin? It begins with salvation. Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. More people have been saved on John 3, 16 than any other verse. Hey, guess what? Hint, that's a good place to begin when talking to your kids about salvation. Because you can explain the whole plan of salvation through John chapter 3, verse 16. And look what it says. It says, for God so loved the world. See, God doesn't hate the world. Immediately, we're painting a picture of God. God loves everyone. God loves everyone. Everyone. Of course, the Calvinist would say, well, he kind of does, but he doesn't. And, you know, no, 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 no. He does. It means what it says and says what it means. For God so loved the world, that's all of us, that he gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, Jesus is saying this verse, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We'll stop right there for a second. Uh, what is it saying? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What does he mean he gave his son? Well, certainly Jesus came into the world, but he came to die. He came to die. Here we are as sinners. God loves us. He loves the world. He loves all of us. He hates our sin. To get to heaven, we have to have our sins all gone. They have to be paid for. God says we are responsible for the payment of our sin. It's our responsibility to get a payment for sin. We're the ones who have sinned. Jesus did not sin. We have sinned. Jesus was perfect. And God says we've earned death. The wages of sin is death. And God says if we pay for our sin, it'll be forever in hell. It's the only payment. Death payment is the only payment acceptable. Now, see, there's nothing we could do to work this sin off because there's nothing we could do to save ourselves. Let this hand represent Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When Jesus died on the cross, he made that payment for us. He paid for all of our sin and for the past, present, future. All of our sin has been paid for by Christ. He died, came back from the dead. And you notice what he says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, what? believes in him. 
believes. It means to trust in him or rely upon him. Whosoever believes or trusts in him should not perish but have what kind of life? Everlasting life. You talk to any child, how long is everlasting? It's forever. Or they'll say, it's forever and ever and ever and ever. Does it ever stop? No. But you talk to some theologians, how long is everlasting? Well, we're not sure about that. You know, everlasting could... No, everlasting means everlasting. Lasting ever means forever. When you trust Christ as your Savior, he saves you forever. You mean to say that nothing I can do to lose my salvation? That's exactly what I'm saying. You're getting it. You cannot lose your salvation once you have it. You are secure no matter what. Even if I sin, you will sin. God doesn't want us to sin. It's not good to sin. It's always bad to sin. But yes, even if you sin, you will not lose your salvation. Even if I, even if I die with unconfessed sin, yes, because if you've trusted Christ the Savior, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he paid for all your sins. You're trusting in him that he did that for you. And when you do, he gives you everlasting life. See, if, if you have to die with you having confessed your sin, then what you're putting your trust in is your confession, not the payment Jesus made on the cross. Do we see it? There are a lot of people who believe, well, if you die with unconfessed sin, you'll go to hell. Friend, confession doesn't pay for sin. Confession has to do with bringing us back into fellowship, but you're not in fellowship unless you're saved. You can't have fellowship unless you're saved. You need to trust Christ as Savior. Look at verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Christ was sent into the world. Christ was not sent into a, a city called the elect. No, he was sent into the entire world. And if he was sent into the entire world, in the verse here, it says, verse 17, the whole world can be saved. And that includes you. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verses that we are familiar with but need to be said. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Look at these with me. It says this, For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You're saved by faith in Christ. When you trust in Christ, God saves you by grace through faith. The moment you put your faith in Christ, God saves you by his grace, not based on our good works of any kind. A lot of kids, you know, and we should be teaching them right and wrong from the very beginning. But many times what, what happens with that, I would say the majority of times what happens with that is that kids get the idea, okay, then that's how I'm going to get to heaven is by works. And you've got to undo that. Because there's a lot of kids, little kids who think, you know, what, what is the thing that pleases mommy and daddy? Well, that when I behave, when I do what's right, okay? So their thinking is, that's how I'm going to get to heaven, is by doing what's right. See, that's the natural man, right? You can't go to heaven by doing what's right, by obeying the principles of God's word. That's not how you're saved. You're saved by trusting in Christ as your Savior. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says this, but God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Teach your children. Talk to your children. Don't preach at them now. Talk with them. Listen, folks, salvation is not them agreeing with you. It's them putting their faith in Christ. Okay, this is, this is big. It's more than them just giving you the answers you're looking for. It's them putting their faith in Christ. That's important. Think about it. You don't want your children to end up in hell. We want them to be saved. Now, it begins with salvation, but it doesn't end with salvation. This teaching of the word is not just the accumulation of knowledge, but the right application of it. And that is what wisdom is all about. We want our children to be wise, not just knowledgeable. We want them to be wise, not just bright. We want them to be wise. Wisdom is much greater than knowledge, but you have to have knowledge to have wisdom, but it doesn't stop with knowledge, it goes on. There's a lot of very knowledgeable, bright people in this world who are as lost as a ball in high weeds. They don't have any wisdom whatsoever. They're fools according to God, and yet they're very knowledgeable. 
There can be no biblical wisdom without the Word of God, for biblical wisdom is based on the Word of God. What is the opposite of a wise person? A fool. A fool. We find spiritual life in the Scriptures. That's why I titled this today, Teaching Our Children the Word of Life. We find spiritual life in the Scriptures. I believe this with all my heart. Any church, any pastor who is truly preaching the Word of God, there will be life in that church if the people are receiving it, if it's being taught, and if the people are receiving it and applying it, that church is going to have life. Why? Because it's the word of life. Philippians 2, holding forth what? The word of life, not the word of misery, not the word of death, not the word of legalism, but the word of life. That's what the scripture produces is life in believers. Wisdom. God wants us to have wisdom, but without knowledge of the scriptures, there will be no wisdom. Proverbs chapter 4, in verse 5, it says this, Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. The ultimate goal is for our children to follow Christ because they see the value of it. Now that's wisdom. Pastor, what are you getting at? Okay. It's training and teaching them to where they have a Christian worldview and their value system is a biblical one. But this is something that somewhere along the line, the children must embrace for their own. And this is a fear, and it's a regular fear. And listen, it's part of parenting, folks. This is part of parenting. It's coming. If you don't already have this in you, it's coming. But you have to trust the Lord, and you have to be faithful in the things that we've been talking about when it comes to training children and discipling our children. Somewhere along the line, they must embrace it for themselves. It's not enough for them to simply cooperate with you they have to see the value of the scriptures. And somewhere along the line, you have to teach them how to have their own, as believers now, you need to teach them how to have their own walk with God and their own devotions and their own time alone with the Lord. And they need to develop their own prayer life. Why? Because you can't do it for them. And as they get older, this has to be something that they desire. Now, how are they ever going to desire it if we're not even teaching them the truth to begin with? And let me say this, they'll never desire it if you're not doing it. Well, I take that back. They probably won't desire it if you're not doing it. Because if they have the Holy Spirit, he's still working in their lives. There are many factors that go into that. One of them, though, is education or instruction. God will use his word in their lives. It's been a blessing for my, my wife and I over the years, watching our children, watching our girls go up. It was our teaching, our teaching of them, them learning from us and all this. And then as time went on, they started uh, developing their own walk, their own time with the Lord, developing that. And as time goes on, then it's something they embrace for themselves. And that's critical. Because why is that critical? Because when they graduate from school and they move away and they go to college, if it's not real in their lives, they're going to go, they're going to crash. It should be there before they graduate. This is a goal in this area of godly biblical instruction. Okay? Look with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. This is this passage, you know it. We've seen it many times. It's a foundation, I believe, on education in the scriptures, along with in the New Testament, Ephesians 6 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it. That thou, You notice, by the way, God's people are to be people of his word. Do we see that? You know, there's a lot of churches today, these new churches. No one brings a Bible. No one brings a Bible. If you bring a Bible, you feel like you're, uh, you're sticking out like a sore thumb. 
that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son, and thy son's son, look at that, four generations, all the days of thy life, that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee. You notice what's the result of doing it? That it may be well with thee and that you may increase mightily as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Stop there for a moment. I want to cover two main issues here with the remaining time this morning. The first is this. This is what is called in the Bible the Great Commandment. This is where it begins. Now, notice that before the issue of teaching the scriptures comes into the picture, I'm, I'm talking about the ex, really heavy explanation of it here. Notice that our daily walk with the Lord is put forth. The direction to the parents is first and foremost, you need to be right with God. You need to be right with God. Your relationship needs to be right with God. You need to love the Lord your God. Look at the language there. With all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. You know, we would, we would look at that and we would think in terms, in New Testament terms, of that's true discipleship. Follow the Lord with everything you've got. Have him first and foremost. Hebrews 13, 5. Be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Christ first and foremost, before the details, the relationship, okay? Before the details, the relationship there. And you notice it's, it, he's talking about loving the Lord. That's an issue of the heart that works itself out. Loving the Lord. If your home life is nothing but rules, your children will have a warped view of God. Folks, we need to be teaching our children how good God is. And we need to be teaching them what it means to love him with everything we have. Because again, if all you have in your house are rules, that's how they're going to see God. And that is not God. That's a warped view of God. Our relationship with the Lord affects our view and attitude towards his word. And so for parents to be in love with God... And to be in love with the Lord, for parents to be in love with the Lord, that is going to be passed through to the children. They're going to sense that, okay? Much of the Christian life is caught, not taught. They're going to sense that. They're going to know that. They're going to be able to observe and see that. More about that in two weeks. But this is a huge thing. And then the approach we have with them, with the Word, is going to be God's way. It's going to be based on a, there's going to be a mentality and an attitude of love and grace. Not do this, do that. The Bible says do this, do that, do this, do that. And if all you have is rules, and if that's all they know is rules, it's a legalistic approach. You might say, well, but, but the principles are there. Yes, they are. They are there. And we are to obey. And they are black and white. But they're not divorced from our great God who loved us and sacrificed his life for us on Calvary. Parents, it is impossible to lead our children somewhere we are not going ourselves. You just can't do it. You just can't do it. And don't try this one on your kids. You do as I say, don't do as I do. You might as well just resign your kids. I've lost them and I don't care. Don't do that. Oh, how children suffer because of their parents. You see, in, in Deuteronomy 6, 5, this is called the great commandment. And the great commandment is to love the Lord with everything you have. If we don't truly love the Lord, our children will know that. And why should they love the Lord if mommy and daddy don't love the Lord? Why should they? Look at verse 6, Deuteronomy 6, 6. And these words, you notice, and comes after loving the Lord first and foremost. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, thine heart. It doesn't say in these words which I command thee this day shall be on the coffee table, gathering dust till next Sunday. Where are they supposed to be? In the heart. You know what that is? That's the mentality of I have willingly received them because I know that this is a blessing from God. 
there's a good spirit, there's a right spirit there. It's, a, it's an issue of relationship, not rules, folks. It's an issue of relationship. They shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Yeah, you will do it diligently and passionately and lovingly if they're in your heart, and you want those things, and you love the Lord, and you want to live for him. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and thou shalt be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house, and on thy gates. Now you look at that, and you know, hopefully there's no one here who takes this approach. Who, boy, those are a lot of rules I've got to do. You're missing it! It flows out of our relationship with God. We are so in love with the Lord and we want to please him with our lives that we can't wait to tell the kids how great the Lord is and how great his word is and to teach them the word of God all the time. It ought to be natural, okay, natural. Be natural in your spiritual life and spiritual in your natural life. It should be our lives. It should not be a rigid, okay, it's Bible time. No, everywhere we step is supposed to be Christianity. Paul said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So they should be getting it all the time. They should be getting it all the time. And again, listen, this is not talking about every time you see your child and every moment they live, you're quoting Bible verses to them and preaching at them. Listen, Billy, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, Billy. Listen, this, you're going to lose them. You're going to lose them if that's the way you are. Okay? You're going to lose them. It begins in the heart, the innermost being. Don't have a legalistic approach to the Bible because that's not God's approach. What does it do? It preserves us. It delivers our lives. We saw in Proverbs, right? Boy, that's something we ought to embrace, folks. We ought to say, wow, this is a miracle book that God has given us. What a gift. What a glory to sit down and read and let God speak to us through the book, not... Okay, it's time for the Bible. Sad to say some parents are that way. Which leads us to our second point. Based on verses 6 through 9, believers have a responsibility to teach our children God's word and ways all day long. All day long. Now again, I'm not talking about preaching at them all day long, but teaching them God's principles. They are to hear God's word and ways all day long. This is not some kind of ritual or drudgery, but a natural reality for the family. Okay, we are supposed to be Christian homes. Christian homes. Not worldly homes with a little Christianity thrown in for good measure. We want them to have a Christian worldview. Again, it doesn't mean that every time you see your kids, you're quoting verses or preaching, but it's an issue of applying God's word to every situation. It is a truly Christian worldview. It is seeing the world and the issues of life as Jesus does and dealing with it his way. Case in point, they're outside playing with little little Johnny neighbor, okay? And little Johnny neighbor mistreats one of your kids, so they come home crying and you say, you know, he, he pushed me or he threw mud in my face or this or that. Okay, well, what did you do? What did you do? Well, I did this or that, okay. Uh, well, here's how the, let's go see how the Lord would have us handle a situation like that. Let's see what God would want us to do in that situation. You're sharing, you're instructing, you're teaching. It's a natural thing. The purpose of the local church is evangelism and discipleship. And the Christian school is an integral part of accomplishing this in the lives of our children. Our children receive time in the Word of God every single day. Their curriculum, their scripture, throughout it, all day long, in every situation. Does that mean that, that the kids in school are perfect? No kids are perfect. No people are perfect. The only perfect person who's ever lived is Jesus. But you know what? When you're, when you're in school, and, and even, if, even in a Christian school, and there's a conflict between two kids or whatever, parents, get together. Say, let's talk about it in a God-honoring way and come to a solution here. Or, or if you don't have to get together as parents, talk to your child and say, okay, how would the Lord have us do this? Well, we're not going to do that. We don't want our children to ever have any conflicts in life. So we're just going to pull them out and we're just going to, we're just going to be, be hermits of some kind. Don't do that. Don't do that. 
They won't know how to, how to deal with people. You've got to teach them how to deal with people. If you look at Deuteronomy and you take it and you believe what it says, how are they supposed to be learning the Word of God? How often are they supposed to be learning the Word of God? Every day, all day. Is that not what it says? It does say that. You know what that points to? It points to Christian education. You know what it doesn't point to? It doesn't point to government education. Now listen, I've got something to say here, and I'm not, I'm not here to, to hurt anybody's feelings or whatever, but I am, to, I am here to talk to you and to be straightforward with you. Because I know there are Christians who they say, well, uh, you know, uh, my kids are going to, I want my kids in a public school because I want them to be a witness there. Now there's going to be plenty of time to witness when they graduate. Okay, don't worry about that. You need to look at the pluses and minuses in this. Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9, cannot be accomplished in a government school. It cannot. It cannot be accomplished in a government school. In many ways, just the opposite is happening. The children are being taught ideas that contradict and undermine the Bible and what Christian parents are trying to accomplish. There's a battle for the minds of the children. Now listen. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying there aren't some dedicated Christians in the public school system. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that every public school teacher, you know, has fangs and a pitchfork and a tail and they're all demonic and all. I'm not saying that. That's just not true. There are some wonderful people who are teachers in the public school system. However, they are not the ones who create the curriculum. And the curriculum has an agenda. You might say, well, I don't... Uh, 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 well, yeah, that's school over there, but my kid's in this public school. No, listen, the curriculum, there's a consistency usually with the curriculum. There may be some exceptions, but there's a, usually a consistency. Uh, see, there's a whole worldview involved in this, folks. There's a worldview. You might say, well, I don't understand that. Here's an easy one for you. Anybody can get this one. When they talk about the beginning of history, where do they begin? Is it not the Big Bang? Or if they talk about the beginning of man's history, is it not at the point when he quit dragging his knuckles when he walked? Sure it is. You know what that is? That is a pagan worldview. You might say, well, that's not going to affect anything. Yes, it is. Because if they embrace that, they're going to go backwards to look, where does all this begin? And it begins with no purpose whatsoever, and they're, and they're going to be taught their lives of no purpose. Might say, well, I'm still not convinced. Well, listen to this. This is taken from the book or article, Learning to Stand for Truth. Coach Dave Dobbenmeyer, Pro Family News, November, December 2006. Here's a question you can ask people who have their children in a public school. And let me say this this morning. If you have your children in a public school, here's some questions for you. I come as a friend and I come as a pastor and I come because I love you and I want to share these things with you, but I want you to think this through. Do you believe that God created you? I said, oh, yes. What is the school teaching your child? Were they created or are they an evolutionary accident? Do you believe in abstinence? Oh, yes. What does your school teach? Condoms. Do you believe that homosexuality is normal? What does your school teach? Do you believe that all families are equal? What does your school teach? Do you believe in absolute truth? What does your school teach? Well, pastor, though, good parenting can reverse all this. Okay, I'll get to that in just a minute. Do you believe our rights come from the government? What does your school teach? Do you believe the environment is more important than an unborn child? What does your school teach? Do you believe that God is the ultimate authority? What does your school teach? Why do you allow your good school to teach your children things you don't believe? It's a fair question. Okay, now listen. I know there are people who say, well, we can undo it. Can you really? And you know, it's, it's more than just the classroom. It's also the environment, what your kids are learning from other kids. You know, the truth of it is, children have already learned sex education before they ever go to sex education classes. Where? In the locker room, in the bathroom, in the hallways. There's a whole educational system that's bigger than the classroom in a government school system. Well, I think I can undo all that. Let me, let me ask you this. How valuable is your child that you would even risk it? I wouldn't risk it personally. My first choice would be to have them in Northland Christian School. Second choice, if we didn't have school, I'd homeschool. 
I wouldn't have them in a government school. I just wouldn't do it because of what they're learning. Let's close over in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3.14, Paul said to Timothy, But continue thou in the things that thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, teaching, for reproof, which is conviction, for correction, which is restoration, for instruction in righteousness, which is training, education, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. What develops the believer? It's the Word of God. That's why God says you need it all day long, because you want to be properly developed to be an effective disciple. And this is what we're trying to do with our children, to teach them, okay, the word of life in the right way, in the context of Scripture, with the mindset of God, to where they will grow up to be effective disciples for Jesus. Well, pastor, I I can't make them believe. You're right, you can't make them believe it. But you know what? We can convince them that it's true in our own way, by the way we live, and by our passion for the truth. Passion for the truth. Are you a parent who's passionate about the Lord and His Word? That goes a long way in the education of your children. Well, friends, that concludes this edition of Voice of Assurance. Thanks so much for listening. And would you share this ministry with a friend? To contact us or learn more about our ministry, please visit www.northlandchurch.com. Your prayers and support for this ministry are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much, and God bless you.